Welcome to the Menstruality Podcast, where we share inspiring conversations about the power of menstrual cycle awareness and conscious menopause. This podcast is brought to you by Red School, where we're training the menstruality leaders of the future. I'm your host, Sophie Jane Hardy, and I'll be joined often by Red School's founders, Alexandra and Shani, as well as an inspiring group of pioneers, activists, change makers, and creatives to explore how you can unashamedly claim the power of the menstrual cycle to activate your unique form of leadership for yourself, your community, and the world. Hey, welcome back to the podcast. Thank you for being with me today. So I have a question for you. What do you do when you've discovered the incredible power of menstrual cycle awareness and you want to share it with your loved ones, your colleagues, your community, but whenever you try to talk about it, you receive reactions that range from disinterest to disgust. The truth is that menstrual shame is real. I experience it all the time when I tell people that I host a podcast about the menstrual cycle and menopause. It's pervasive and overcoming it is a key part of restoring the power, the beauty, the magic of the menstrual cycle at the heart of our world. And luckily we're standing on the shoulders of giants here, like the menstrual trailblazer, Jane Bennett, who has been busting through this menstrual taboo for 40 years. Jane Bennett is a social worker, a researcher, a writer, an educator, and the founder of the Chalice Foundation and Celebration Day for Girls. In our first menstruality podcast episode with Jane, we explored how to create positive menstrual cultures, and she shared what she learned from gathering the stories of over 3,000 women and girls about the current attitudes to the menstrual cycle to write her book about bloody time, the menstrual revolution we have to have. And in my conversation with Jane today, we explore the historical roots of menstrual shame in our patriarchal society, some really useful tips that Jane uses from Brene Brown's work about cultivating shame resilience, and Jane's top advice for how to support your loved ones to have an aha moment about the menstrual cycle so they can get on side and support you with your menstrual cycle awareness practice. Jane Bennett, I've been looking forward to this ever since we had to reschedule last week (laughs) and before that, because you really are one of the mothers of this movement. You have been working on this for so long and it's just a real honour to be able to sit with you. And the question I'm really holding is how to make the world love periods. (laughs) Hi, Sophie. It's It's a great topic too. And I'm forever pondering that myself. And looking at all all the different ways that suddenly work or don't for a long time, or it's a it's a perpetual question, really. Yeah, there's so much we can unpack. I mean, it's connected to so many threads around shame and our culture, and yeah. So we've we've got lots to get into today. But before we do, I'd love to start as we always start, which is with a cycle check in, and I'd love to hear what cycles you're with in your life at the moment. Hmm. Well, clearly I'm postmenopausal, so it's probably, I can't remember now, uh, you know, I'm day thousands and thousands, I can't remember what it is. I work it out every now and again. (laughs) (laughs) And as far as the cycles I'm in, I'm very aware of the, uh, you know, we're in the middle of a, a little string of eclipses at the moment, which is always interesting, and uh, I am feeling that extra edge and sparkiness that can come with a you know betwixt and between eclipses so I'm I'm just curious and noticing that yeah and we've just passed the autumn equinox here so that means the spring is coming in yeah yeah big time I'm watching I'm watching sort of flowers but you know flower spikes coming up in the garden and uh when I got up this morning there was a kangaroo just outside the kitchen window Wow. Just, you know, they, they, they hop off when I turn the light on, but they're just there, you know, doing their, you know, having their breakfast. <laughs> oh, that's so lovely. Um, I'm in my inner summer, which is really handy because my husband's away. So I'm with 
my son and my dog and they're a lot and work is a lot and so I'm really enjoying this ovulatory energy and just relishing it and making the most of it and already plotting my slowing down and rest <laughs> like in a week's time I've got some plans for that yeah what I'm with for today is you know there are lots of different people in this community gathered around this podcast you know there are the graduates of the Menstruality Leadership Programme. Hi there, if you're listening, um, who are really committed to bringing this work of honouring the power and the magic of the menstrual cycle out in the world. There's also many other professionals who are sharing about the cycle, the power of the cycle, about menopause. And then there's a whole load of women and people who um, are just really turned on about this practice of tracking our cycles and being with our own rhythms and our own ebb and flow and the and the agency that we have over our lives then and it, our inner lives and our outer lives and all of the magic that comes with it. And what I'm with to explore with you, Jane, is what do we do when we have all of this passion and we want to tell people about it, but when we tell them, the reactions range from disinterest to disgust, really. And like, what do we do about this? Because obviously we're all inside the truth that there's something very magical here. And maybe we can start with that. Like, I'd love to hear in your words why you feel, why you've devoted 40 years to this, right? Like why you feel the world needs to be in love with the menstrual cycle. <laughs> well, probably quite similar to all of those who you've sp spoken about, who are listening, who are passionate about this work. And uh, it, it came alive for me in my mid-20s when I learnt uh, natural fertility management, fertil which are fertility awareness methods, to manage my contraceptive needs. And I'd already had a little bit of a journey with the pill and uh, an IUD, which at those times didn't have hormones uh, attached to them. Mm. neither of which were great. Uh, then I discovered a, diaph a diaphragm and I quite loved the diaphragm. It was a lot less intrusive. <laughs> uh, and then I got to know Francesca Nash. I was living in Sydney at the time and Francesca Nash uh, started Natural Fertility Management and she put together the, the current methods uh, the, you know, the Billings method uh, that was uh, discovered by the doctors Billings in Melbourne uh, in the 50s and 60s and, uh, and the symptothermal method or the, the temperature method, which together is the symptothermal method, uh, as well as the lunar cycle, the work of Dr. Eugene Yonash from Czechoslovakia. Uh, and so this, I was doing some work in the same uh, multi-mode uh, clinic and thought, oh, this sounds really interesting. This sounds really interesting. And it still took me from the moment that I heard about it to the moment that I actually made an appointment. And it, and it took two things. One was uh, a, a new boyfriend who was also really interested. And so it was that, you know, we're, we're, we're on this journey together. Uh, so that was great. And the other thing that happened that I realised later was while intellectually I thought this sounded really good, nothing in my life up to that point had given me any indication that I could know my body mm -hmm. and read the signs of my fertility well enough to make decisions about contraception, which clearly for anyone making decisions about contraception is pretty important. Uh, but with the support of my new boyfriend, uh, we, we went along and saw Francesca. And in those days, it was an audio tape and Ronio sheets and, um, you know, a, a description from her and, and a, a, an appointment in a month's time. So I went home and started uh, taking my temperature and checking mucus and filling in my chart and, you know, reading the notes. And it was all sort of very interesting. And what I found uh, you know, certainly by a month in <laughs> that I could, you know, see the pattern of my cycle. And by the second month, I could start to say, okay, I know I'm not fertile then. And I know I'm not fertile then. And those windows, as I got more familiar with the whole process, were able to grow. 
And uh, to me, this was it was a massive epiphany. I mean, the the capacity to it was like a veil dropped. The capacity to read myself and see that oh, I can see I get those symptoms every month, a few days before my cycle. It empowered me to be able to do something about that. It empowered me to be able to help myself uh, and and understand the ebbs and flows and ups and downs of the of the cycle. Uh, and make choices for myself. So that's where it really started. And, uh, uh, you know, soon after that, I was, start, you know, I got the passion <laughs> that I, I really wanted to share this. And I, I uh, you know, got together with Francesca and we, um, you know, wrote uh, resources for natural fertility management together and ran training programs for a long time. Uh, and we still do some work together. So, uh, but, you know, along the way, and, and that happened, and we, we sort of managed to convert people and particularly health professionals that were very keen to share this too. But I, I have to say, on the back of my enthusiasm, I was really surprised because I thought this would be amazing for everybody. And as soon as they'd hear about it, they'd just jump at it. Um, and it was many years later that I realised, you know, this is the nature of this deeply unconscious uh, thread of menstrual shame, the menstrual taboo that runs through our society. And it's, it's a collective thing. It's a collective unconscious thing. So for many, uh, you know, women and others who menstruate who may not identify as carrying menstrual shame themselves, we do collectively because we're, because we're mostly fairly polite people. We don't like to bring it up with other people in case they feel uncomfortable. Uh, so it stays underground and stays quiet. And for in a large part, uh, people stay isolated in their experience and ignorant about what's going on for them. Uh, and, and all the fallout from that for health and well-being uh, over over a lifetime. So that's that's sort of where it got me going. And I uh, so if, once I really started to understand the uh, the the process of menstrual shame and see the many different ways that that manifests, uh, you know, you, you can really start to see it everywhere. In fact, uh, my uh, celebration day for girls trainer team, uh, we came up with an acronym, uh, which is BOMS, BOMS. <laughs> uh, and it, what, it, what it means is uh, because of menstrual shame. So you'll see something happening or you'll see a response or you'll see a lack of something that's really obvious. Uh, and we just say it's BOMS, 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 BOMS. <laughs> um, so the, the nature of this is, is like a, um, I, I sometimes think of it like a, in homeopathy, they talk about a miasm, and a miasm is a a fog that 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 makes it really hard to see things, and it spreads throughout the population. Uh, and I think menstrual shame is is like that, and uh, deeply unconscious, and you know it it affects it affects everybody. It affects relationships. It affects, as I said earlier, uh, it affects our our health and our well being and. Uh, really is undermining in all quarters, really. Yeah, our connection to ourselves, our our capacity to be with our own selves and our own bodies. There's a there's like a wedge in the way or a veil in the way. Because I just always want to get to the roots of things. I mean, this is a big conversation, but it just it feels important to just name it. Like, let's remember menstrual blood is the lifeblood that feeds the embryo this is sacred it is potent it is magical really like it's the stuff of life and just <laughs> brief like history of time what do you attribute this menstrual shame to like when it when it's such a incredibly magical substance mm. a lot has been written about that and uh you know it it, it Part of it would be lost in the in the mists of time, uh, but I do think in 
you know, all the different forms of patriarchy as it's as it's developed, you know, over thousands of years around the world. Um, the 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 part of the menstrual cycle that uh, makes sense for patriarchy is ovulation because that's when we can conceive. Uh, that's when we're at our sexiest uh, and often most interested in sex. Uh, and it's the it's a, and conception is productive and it's bringing you know uh, bringing new life. Whereas menstruation, you know, is uh, is messy. It's often uncomfortable. Uh, it's it may be uh, oftentimes women are needing space to do their own thing and to be themselves and and may not be so socially pleasing <laughs> and pleasant at those times uh, and are a bit more have a bit more agency. So menstruation would would start to and you can see it with the ancient Greeks the, whose writings we still have like Galen. Um, you know, we start to see it getting, a, you know, a really, a really bad rap uh, mm -hmm. because it's it's not understood as uh, this. Is, it's important for our health. It's for, it's an important uh, cycle and process for women, and uh, and and all parts of that are important. Uh, so it's it got that bad uh, reputation because. What's the point of it <laughs> uh, from the perspective of patriarchy? So we can still see that uh, played out, and this is a bombs, if you like, uh, in a lot of how, um, I can't give you a percentage, but I think it's way too high, of how medicine is practised that we'll see the, the cycle, unless you're wanting to conceive, as unnecessary. There's yeah. no purpose to it. We'll just we'll just wipe it away. Um and then when you want it back, well, either either it'll come back naturally or we can give you something else for it. So it's not understood to be of value in and of itself. So we're obviously we're starting, other than we understand great benefits of it, even science is just starting to catch up a little bit with some really good uh, research, particularly from Professor Geraldine Pryor in Canada, Who's showing us the uh, the incredible benefits of having a full menstrual cycle and natural ovulation year after year after year, uh, and how well that sets up us up for uh, health uh, and well being in the in the menopausal years. Mm. I find it fascinating that given the incredible feminist movement that we've seen over the past several decades. It feels like the menstrual cycle and menstruation are like the ugly duckling. There is so much that women have claimed back for ourselves and space that we're taking in the world. Um, and also for, you know, from an intersectional perspective, women who are also on the margins because of their race or identity. You know, there's so much more space. There's still so much more work to be done, um, particularly in this political climate that we're in. But there's... It's, it, I just find it fascinating sitting with you right now, Jane, that like, wow, still, you know, so many of the women that I speak to who are very uh, empowered in their lives probably call themselves feminist. When I tell them that I host a podcast about the menstrual cycle, they they squirm, you know, and they look away and they don't know what to say and they think I'm weird. I'm trying to ask you a question now, but I'm all like G'd up with my ovulatory energy about this. Um, maybe, you know, what have you seen in terms of reactions in your own life and how have you met those reactions? Mm, mm. I've seen lots of different reactions <laughs> and, uh, and, I've, and I've contemplated them a lot over the years. And in the uh, late 90s for about seven years, 96 to 2003, I uh, had a small uh, cloth pad business and one of the things I used to do is, you know, put these, uh, go to, go to you know, alternative fairs and put them out in baskets and have a big sign and, you know, and, and it was really, really interesting the different responses that people would have. So uh, sometimes, you know, they'd become, people come by and have a look and, so oh, what are, the, are these for glasses cases or this is this this new headache thing?
thing. And, and then they'd read a bit more or I'd talk to them. And, you know, it wasn't one response. There were so many different responses. But there were certainly people who go, oh, 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 and they'd get very urgently busy going off to do something else. Um, and then, and you couldn't pick them. You couldn't pick who would, it, it wasn't the most switched, you know, switched on looking or the most alternative looking. Uh, sometimes it would be the straightest looking that would be go, oh, this is such a great idea. You know, and how do they work and what do we do? And I'm going to buy some for myself and my sister. And uh, so it really varied a lot. I, one of my favourites was uh, a couple of guys coming by. They were a metre or a couple of metres back from the from the front because there were some women looking at things. And one guy was explaining to his mate what they were for. And he would say, oh, yeah, my wife, you know, really enthusiastically, they're really great. That means they don't have to do this and this. And she really loves them. And I like to help her fold them and put them back, you know, up when we bring the washing in. And, oh, my God, it was, uh, it was great. So you get all kinds. Um, what I did learn with the people who had a, you know, a strong negative reaction I rather than get distressed about that, I realized uh, that you know this is po possibly the first time they've bumped into a different approach, yeah. uh, a different way of looking at menstruation, or having it expressed openly and comfortably. And I, I just like to my fantasy about that was it would it would they wouldn't forget it would winkle its way in and so neck into their mind and, and next time they would see something different they they might be a little more open to it so these things these things take time and i think you know we're in the we're looking at the long arc of history and when i look at where things were in the say the 90s compared to now mm -hmm. There is, you know, there's been this amazing flourishing of efforts and creativity and, you know, and, and activism and philanthropy and uh, books and stories and podcasts. And, you know, it, it's just there's so many conversations. So I think that's really important. And for people just, just circling back to, you know, what you were asking about people who are wanting to share this, I think... You do what you can do. You know, if there's an opening, you talk about it. Uh, and you can always open the door and say something and see if there's a response. And, of course, it can be wonderful when there's a response and somebody in a positive way and someone is curious and wants to know more. Um, and some days you won't feel like that because it's, you know, it, it can feel a little outside your own comfort zone and that's okay too. I think... One of the most important things we can do and, and that someone who is exploring and excited about and comfortable about menstrual cycle awareness is, is the, the, the presence with their own cycle and their presence even with someone else's discomfort. So if you can be aware of the, um, you know, what what this embarrassment or shame looks like um, or or notice oh that's that's where that's coming from and uh, and and aren't sort of drawn into being reactive yourself but are just able to see that and be present with it um, that staying present and staying in your own body which is also what menstrual cycle awareness really helps us do uh, is is really powerful and it may or may not be that that person will say oh this is so interesting I'm so glad you're telling me about this they may but they may not uh, but the fact of you doing that and being being present uh, maybe you you might feel compassion you might feel love you might feel equanimity about their response uh, you may feel irritated by their response too of course uh, but still present with that you know and that that is a catalyst. You know, it's quite powerful. And I think if we can just see that we're going, you know, we're at the pointy end of something here and we are going to get all kinds of reactions. Um, so I would encourage everybody just, 
just to keep going, be sensitive to the to the moment, push the push the edges, um, and you know find find the places that you can have conversations, and you know lots of wonderful creative ways you can do that too. You might leave a couple of books on your desk or have a little sign up with where you are in your cycle or make you know have conversations with the uh, the powers that be at work and make sure there are products available uh, for for when uh, when we get caught out when people get caught out or that there's conversations happening about uh, workplace policy or there's conversation you know there's lots of different ways to do these things and and what do we do at home? For, uh, you know, we might know where we keep our cloth pads or whatever we're using, but, you know, do we have in our, in our toilets or our bathrooms visible menstrual products for, for women who come who, you know, who may suddenly get caught out uh, and a bin that they can use? Just simple stuff like that. Uh, just, you know, find the what I would call the low-hanging fruit. What are, what are the simple messages and that are overt? Uh, There's just a few ideas from the top of my head, Sophie. <laughs> mm, wow, it's such a wealth of practical ideas. And I'm also very moved by what you shared about how menstrual cycle awareness cultivates our capacity to be present with ourselves and particularly with discomfort and that our capacity to do that with others is transformative in and of itself like that is a way of dissolving menstrual shame by being with ourselves and what it's making me think of is like early on in the practice of cycle awareness I experienced quite a lot of doubt like is this real am I really is there really a pattern here like do I really get grouchy at the same time every month like and then later into my practice, all oh, my inner spring, there's all kinds of stuff going on in here, like pre-ovulation that I didn't realize. Like, it's just a never ending journey, isn't it? But the, the more we practice day after day after day, checking in, how am I doing? How's my energy? How's my mood? If we can find a way to track where we can look back at previous months to start to really see the patterns. And then it's not like someone outside of us, again, an authority outside of us has told us that you should practice menstrual cycle awareness because you have four inner seasons. And like, no, it's I practice menstrual cycle awareness. So I know myself. I know how I change. I have my own evidence. I don't need the stamp of approval or authority from anyone else. And that um, authority is also transformative, isn't it? Absolutely. Incredible. And, and, you know, it's black and white, really, c compared to the, um, you know, you, you can't know yourself, yeah. uh, so you just do what I say uh, approach, which I would hope is starting to dissipate, but it's still out there and there's still a lot of disparaging of, you know, the, the experience of, of women and women being able to say this, this, this is what I'm experiencing. I know what it is. I know what's happening here. So, you know, by practicing it and, and by getting that sense of, you know, we do know ourselves and we, as you said it beautifully, uh, you know, we have that authority for ourselves. It's radical. It's revolutionary. And uh, it's, it's so empowering to be able to stand with that clarity in the centre of our own life even on the days when we feel maybe like shit or maybe totally confused. <laughs> but if we know it and we've observed it and it's like, okay, this is what happens here. This is one of the, one of the ways that this manifests. We can still be present with that. We can trust ourselves. And, and, that, the, and that the wheel keeps turning. Yes. Okay, I'm going to pause this conversation with Jane just for a moment to share an invitation. If you're listening to this and you're feeling passionate about creating positive menstrual cultures and moving through menstrual shame in your relationships, at work, with your community, we invite you to visit redschool.net forward slash cycle power, where you can find out more about Red School's new cycle power course. It's a six week self paced program guided by Alexandra and Shani, the co founders of Red School, to awaken the magic of the menstrual cycle in your life by embodying the power of your inner seasons, the four different phases of the menstrual cycle. It's for you if you've been cycle tracking for three months or three years or more. 
The intention for the course is to help you learn how to restore your own inner ecology so you can soothe your nervous system, express your needs, hold your boundaries and be nourished, especially by the spiritual power of menstruation. You can find out more about the course at redschool.net forward slash cycle power. I'm thinking of uh, a story that Lucy Peach shared with me. Have you hung out with Lucy Peach? I haven't. We we live at opposite ends of this vast country here, but yeah. but we know certainly know of each other and we've been in contact. Yeah. Well, she was. She might have told you this. You might have heard this story, but she said when we interviewed her on the podcast that she was chatting with one of her theatre friends, a male theatre friend, and he said, "Lucy, you, you don't half talk about your period a lot, mate. Like you really do." And she said, well, it's a big deal for me. Like, and what would you rather I spoke about? My shit. And he said, well, yeah, actually, I think I would. I think I would prefer it. And it's just like, just to normalize again, the kind of experiences that that we have. You have a phrase that I discovered when planning this conversation with you around mo- helping people move from resistance and denial to acceptance and excitement. You've already spoken, you've shared so many great practical ideas for this, but maybe we can just unpack this a bit more. You also speak about this idea of shame resilience. Like what guidance would you give to us listening about cultivating shame resilience as we go out in the world and chat about our menstrual cycles? Thank you. I'm so glad you brought that up. Um, Well, I'll just give you a little bit of background. It's somewhere along this wondrous journey for me. I uh, I was diving into Brene Brown's work, and I'm sure everyone listening is uh, very familiar with Brene Brown, and her particularly her research into shame, which she speaks so wonderfully about in her TED Talks. Um, and she, with all that research, she found that uh, the, and she was studying women particularly, so uh, she found that the women who uh, weren't, living with shame to such an, you know, weren't crippled by shame. Had she studied them, she did the whole science number on it and and realised they had particular qualities or they were good at particular things and that's how they, they dealt with these, these tricky sort of things. And, of course, uh, Renee wasn't especially studying um, menstruation. However, I felt that it really fit beautifully and so there were there were four things that she particularly found uh, that uh, you know really helped uh, with shame uh, resilience, and that it wasn't just that you're naturally born with these and you have it or you don't have it. That you can practice them, and you can you can have them you have them uttermost in your mind. So one is practice critical awareness. So be, you know, think about what uh, your responses are, what the responses are around you, uh, what's going on for somebody and, you know, and, and practising it. I mean, I'm adding this bit, <laughs> but practising it with compassion as well, with with a kind of a neutrality and, and compassion uh, that people aren't meaning to be mean or nasty. It's just something that's, that's uh, unconscious for them. Um, she also talked about, uh, you know, that, that goes alongside practicing critical awareness is seeking knowledge, seeking to understand, uh, what's going on. And again, probably anyone listening to this podcast is, is already well on a journey of, of seeking to understand their own cycle and, and the ins and outs of, of the menstrual cycle. I think we can all ourselves the the menstrual nerds those of us that in in a list yes <laughs> <Right. Good. laughs> we're in good company yes we 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 do love it don't we uh another is to recognize and understand our own triggers so being practicing that uh awareness being able to notice when we're triggered and one of the ways to understand shame i mean shame does not feel good if we're feeling shame we really want the, you know, it's the 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 archetypal. We want the ground to open up and swallow us. Uh, it feels really bad. So 
when uh, people are shamed by somebody else or uh, it's get their, their, their sense of shame around a particular topic is getting triggered, um, uh, you know, we just want to disappear. And that's why menstrual shame stays you know, largely so unconscious because we just run a mile. We don't want to sit and look at it. We don't want to really unpick it and unpack it and, and see what it's all about. Uh, and that's why I've really noticed over the years that uh, shame and, and particularly my focus on menstrual shame, it shape shifts. It shape shifts mm -hmm. quite quickly. So while someone might gain awareness in one part, it can turn into something else, uh, you know, shame of why didn't I know, I should have known that earlier or I'm ashamed of how I, you know, taught my children about this, you know, 10 years ago or whatever it was. The, there, there can be lots of different ways that that can change. Mm. Um, another is being, you know, when we're feeling shame, and this is hard to do, is to reach out. If we if we find ourselves triggered, uh when, when our impulse is to scuttle under a rock somewhere, uh, is to reach out to somebody we feel will understand, someone we, we feel safe with, of course, but it can still be gut-wrenching to actually say what we feel ashamed about, what we're feeling this shame about. But reaching out and connecting rather than isolating is key. And then to be able to speak about it, to be able to speak about the shame we feel. Um, and like a lot of things that are the most difficult to communicate about, when we, you know, when maybe when we first do it, it can feel huge. Uh, when, and even subsequently, if, if shame, the feeling of shame is present, it can still feel big. But when we've exercised that muscle and we do it and we know it's good, and we know it's going to going to help. Uh, it it does it does get easier, and it makes sense, and it can be over really quickly, <laughs> you know. And we're able to again just just notice, grow from it, or even laugh at at what what the trigger was. Uh, so these are the these are the features of uh, of shame resilience, and of course we can have shame about all kinds of things. Um, but particularly at this moment, just just being aware of those features that uh, we we may have noticed in ourselves in the past, or our reluctance to speak and be open and connect with others, uh, and where that comes from. Uh, and I'm sure many who have done uh, the the leadership program and who are listening have have explored their own past experience of. Uh, it, and how they were educated about menstruation um, and, and have worked through a lot of these uh, features of shame resilience because of that process. Um, but I think, again, just coming back to the, the, the theme of our conversation is being aware that other people, when we're wanting to share our experience with friends and family and colleagues, is they may be at another point in that in that continuum um, and it can take time but uh, the most powerful thing is how we show up I think yes coming back to that um, presence piece again cultivated yep. by our own practice yeah and time is so important like it it is very slow work this isn't it and it's good to name it you it know is. I've been tracking my cycle for 13 years and I'm still you know still have this edge with my husband around I need and deserve rest when I bleed you know it's like okay 13 years in so come on <laughs> like you can claim this but every month there's always a little challenge around okay can I am I allowed is this okay you know so we all have our edges that it's just a work of a menstruating lifetime and then comes menopause and menopause is its own whole huge initiatory process Indeed. Thank you for breaking that down. I wrote them down, actually. Number one, critical awareness. Number two, seeking knowledge. Number three, exploring our own triggers. Number four, reaching out. Number five, speaking the shame. 
as pathways to cultivate shame resilience. As you were speaking, I was thinking about the trauma that we carry, all of us, but particularly women or those like socialized as female, just the trauma of living in a patriarchal society and the multiple small but very impactful traumas that we experience throughout our lives around body image, how we're perceived, what people have thought was possible for us or not, the opportunities that we've had or not, you know, they, they're cumulative, you know, and that's part of the, the miasma, I think you called it, the miasm, the miasm, yeah, the fog around this, so. Like orgasm, but miasm. (laughs) (laughs) I'm, I'm really moved by this, like bringing compassion and presence to where people are at in their own shame journey. Yeah. I think I, I might do a bit of shaming myself of people who aren't like down with this menstrual thing yet, you know, and it's like, no, no, it's, yeah, we're all on, like you said, we're all at a different place on the spectrum. Could we speak about what you're currently exploring and doing and teaching with Emily, you know, about skilling menstrual teachers up so that they can head out into the world and and teach why have you felt called to to move in this direction now wow well we uh with emily stewart and others on our uh celebration day for girls leadership team which is a a group of uh, women who have been been running that particular workshop for quite a few years I just realised that there may be people listening who don't know what Celebration Day for Girls is. Would you mind describing it for us? Sure. So Celebration Day for Girls is a program that I created in the year 2000. So it's a millennial baby. Wow. Uh, And I created it uh, because I was invited by a local school to run a program for uh, girls in Australia in year five. So, you know, turning 11 in that year and their mums. And the school wonderfully gave me a whole day, you know, have a day, have a day to do it and a day on the weekend. Uh, I hadn't been trained to teach children. Uh, I hadn't had an experience of teaching children. I was a mum, so, you know, hang, hang out with kids. But, you know, I was asked to do this because of my experience with natural fertility management. And, of course, I wasn't never in a thousand years going to say no. (laughs) Uh, So I created uh, Celebration Day for Girls and, uh, you know, it landed and we had a ball and then, you know, gradually I started to do it in other places. And then in 2012, you know, this really grew and grew and was getting to the point where I can't do all of this. (laughs) And, uh, and, uh, you know, there were certainly other women interested in running this program too. So in 2012, I started training women in, uh, and in 2012, I actually, uh, I ran a a training in Australia and in the UK. Uh, And, uh, and have, you know, we've run those trainings ever since. So we've got facilitators now in 29 going 30 soon countries wow and yeah and and the the program is run in uh spanish uh spanish french uh chinese uh german afrikaans i can't remember quite a few countries (laughs) quite a few languages i can't remember them all uh, so that's that's that sort of was the foundation uh, of of this, and then we have felt over recent years that we really wanted to provide a very solid foundational course for menstrual education, um, because uh, sometimes people would want to come along to our training, but they really just want to get well grounded in what they need for menstrual education. It wasn't that particular program that they wanted or they didn't know. So uh, over the last couple of years, we've sort of particularly, uh, you know, created the curriculum and worked care- very carefully on what is it that what are the things that we really need to be well grounded in for to be able to offer menstrual education. And, of course, there's there's different styles, different philosophic sort of uh, underpinnings and so on. Uh, but still there's there's skills and abilities and tools that we can add 
on top of our own mental cycle awareness practice or our own fertility awareness practice or whatever else we want to call it, um, it's beyond that. It's like, okay, we've had that, ex- you know, for those who have, we've had that experience or we're, we're continually having that experience. We get how important this is. We want to share it with others, whether it's uh, young people or um, adults or older uh, older people going through menopause. Uh, we want to share this, the value of understanding this and the the, the value of these practices how do we do it though? You know, it's uh, and how do we do it in different settings? And how do we do it for mixed settings? How do we do it for boys and men as well? Um, and you know, in different age groups and and different time allowances. So, what might be our purpose for you know one one group compared to another? So, there's lots of things to think about and lots of uh, you know, foundational skills and knowledge as well as practices and ways to ways to that I, I think one of the things we do uh, we gave a lot of thought to as well you know through our understanding of menstrual shame and you know and really unpacking that in the course so that uh, our the participants can really get a good grip on that too is then how do we how do we set up aha moments how do we set up the, the skills for um, uh, and 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 help people really be able to learn in a in a very uh, sort of po- very positive very en- you know positively energized environment. So there's there's lots of different things we cover, and probably the the proof of the pudding <laughs> is that uh, so far we've had you know very positive responses from those who have come to the course. And in the first, so we're we're currently in our second intake, um, and a lot of the participants are already menstrual educators uh, who are f- discovering that oh, okay, this really adds a lot to what I'm trying to do, uh, and that's great uh, to know that we're able to help with that, and it's very gratifying. It's like oh, okay, we looks like we're on the right track. <laughs> I'd love to hear a bit about what, or maybe maybe you could just like give one teaser tip for something that can help to create aha moments around the menstrual cycle. Maybe maybe I'll particularly ask this question through the lens of speaking to a partner because it's a question that we get loads at Red mm-hmm. School. Could you give us a tip for how to create an aha moment between you and a partner or you and a close friend? Mm, okay, I'll, I'll tell you about a particular uh, activity that I've done that I that I I was really contemplating hard at one point. I had a a short amount of time with groups of teachers uh, in, in schools around um, Australia and sometimes New Zealand uh, who weren't necessarily introduced to menstrual cycle awareness or didn't have a practice. Um, and I had a short amount of time to kind of how do I how do I get that aha uh-huh. you know it's 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 big and so I gave this a lot of thought. So what I what I have done, and you know I, I'm sure everyone's uh, familiar with the uh, the four seasons uh, metaphor, uh, but I use it in a different way. And so what I did was get get cards with uh, you know pictures of the pictures of the seasons, uh, pictures of the four sort of um, uh, stations, if you like, of the day, so day, night, dawn, dusk, uh, and I'd sort of put them out on the floor so we'd all be standing up. And I've done this with a group of 47 men as well. So I've done Mm -hmm. it with, you know, small groups and larger groups. Um, And so put these out and say, okay, just go to your favourite season. Go to your favourite season. And then I'd ask a few people, well, tell me about that. So it's it's quite light, it's easy, it's not confronting. So tell me, you know, what do you love about winter or what do you love? You know, so we get a bit of that. Uh, and then I put the stages of the day on top of those. So I would put night on winter, I'd put dawn on spring and, and so on. So, okay, you know, move to whichever is your favourite, um, <laughs> excuse me, 
your favourite time of day. And we'd sort of follow that, uh, follow that around. So it was done quite lightly. You know, it wasn't like this is a big, really big, serious uh, activity. Uh, and sometimes they'd say, oh, well, can I just stand in between these? Or I like this and this. I said, well, just for the sake of this exercise, just, you know, pick one. <laughs> uh, so, so we do that. And then on top of those, I would put uh, menstruation on winter. I would put pre-ovulation on spring, uh, ovulation on summer and, and so on. And, and then the energy changed in the room. <laughs> it's like, oh, <laughs> um, usually it will change. And, uh, and so, okay, go to, the, go to the favorite part of your cycle. Now, with groups of women who hadn't been introduced to this uh, practice before, that was that was quite radical. You know, do I have a favorite time of my cycle? And, you know, uh, and, and sometimes or very often I have to say it was, it was so poignant and uh, tragic what they would say. So I very often heard, well, that half of the month is right off for me. And, you know, they were working in, uh, you know, workplaces where there was no time or space to take care of themselves or do, do anything differently, which, of course, exacerbated what was difficult about their cycle. Anyway, there's a lot of personal stories there. Um, but it, that, and then we, so we'd have, you know, we'd go through and have a little talk about that too, and then we'd unpack it. So I would unpack it by saying, and you could do this equally with a partner or a group, uh, I'd unpack it by saying, you know, when we're, when we're in the seasons, you know, for people who are not thinking about inner seasons, when we're in the seasons, we're all in spring or summer or winter at the same time. So we understand when someone's got their, their big woolly boots on and their woolly hat and three jumpers and coats and stuff. It makes sense. If someone were to walk down the street in, uh, um, you know, a, a bikini, uh, you know, and bare feet, it would seem really odd. Um, and, and similarly with, with day, you know, stages of the day, I mean, we have different preferences. We like different things, but we're still in it. You know, there's still sort of some, some norms around that and observable norms. Most people sleep at night rather than some people work at night, um, but it still has different qualities. So the point I'm making for those groups is that, uh, the menstrual cycle is equally powerful uh, and yet it's invisible for each woman is going through her own powerful changes uh, within the cycle. But we, uh, you know, as well as the seasons and the day-night cycle. Um, so that in itself, and we can continue to unpack that depending on the conversation, you know, and what's coming up for people. But that in itself creates a big aha. Uh -huh. It's not, it's, ch it's changing the narrative from, well, it's something very private that you hide away and you pretend that's not happening. So as far as I know, it's not happening. Uh, back to actually, you know, this is a really important part of you and how you are uh, meeting the day and how you are present right now and you know whether it's the you know the super you know what are the superpowers at different times what are the challenges at different times um and this is all playing out even if it's not obvious to everybody else but if we empower women to be able to know it and share it and ask for the help they need or work longer hours and get more done <coughs> at particular times Whatever, whatever needs to happen, or put in put in an all nighter on a painting she wants to get finished, or whatever it is, uh, that that's all understood in this uh, context. So that's that's uh, a big long answer to your question, but I have found that uh, one way or another, it always works. Wow, that is genius! I love that idea. That's so beautiful. Thank you, Jane. Could you let us know how people can find out about the course? Yes. 
So if they go to chalicefoundation.org, so that's just all one word as it sounds, Chalice Foundation, uh, there's a page on there about the uh, the course. At the moment, registrations, uh, enrolments are closed, uh, but they can, uh, they can, people can uh, request to be informed. Uh, you know, jo join the newsletter. We'll let them know. We we definitely don't inundate you with with news because we just don't get around to that sort of thing very much. Um, but we will let you know when the when the enrolments open again. And we will the next intake will be in or the next start of the next course will be February next year. Uh, and then we're planning one mid year and then one later in the year uh, next year. So there'll be three three intakes next year. Uh, there's a certain amount of the material is on Teachable. So once someone has enrolled, they can start to access that. Then we have eight uh, discussion sessions online, you know, live online, uh, that we can look through uh, a particular module each week and really unpack it and have time to really talk with each other <laughs> and uh, and the other participants. So it's a it's a real blast. We've got participants from eight countries in this uh, in this intake. Uh, we, we're actually running it in two time zones just to help it work for everybody. <laughs> so that's a lot of fun. It sounds absolutely magnificent and I wish you all the best with it. And I just have one final com um, question because I'm thinking back to in the 90s when you started exploring this to where we are now and how much progress we've made. And I just would love to hear what you would love to see in the next 10, 20, 30 years when it comes to help, you know, the world being in love with periods? Mm, gosh, what a what a delicious, what a delicious question. Well, I would like to see that it's it's just becomes normal that uh we we know how to educate. We know how to uh in in a really wholesome way. Uh, in schools and in families and uh, and and then in workplaces too so so that it's we just it just becomes normal we just expect to be able to take care of ourselves and ask for what we need um, and there's policies to support this in schools and at work um, and we understand that this is you know, just really healthy and really normal and uh, really wonderful uh, yeah. for not just those who are menstruating or uh, going through perimenopause or menopause, but the whole of society and the the release of creative energy and health and well-being and uh, spirituality is, uh, who can say where we'll be? Watch this space. Yeah. What's this space? Exactly. Jane, it's been absolutely gorgeous to be with you. It's been a real honour and a joy. And um, yeah, I am so grateful for everything that you've done to help to steward this movement and midwife it and bring it into the world. And so deep gratitude from me and from our listeners. And uh, I look forward to chatting again next time. Mm, you too. Thank you so much, Sophie. It's been delightful as always. <laughs> Thanks, love. Bye. Hey, thanks for joining us today. Thank you for listening all the way through. If you enjoyed this podcast, it would be so great if you could leave us a review on Apple Podcasts or wherever you listen and subscribe. make sure that you're subscribed or following. It really helps the podcast to reach more people. And as I mentioned in the middle of our conversation with Jane, if you're feeling called to reclaim the magic and power of your cycle, come on over to redschool.net forward slash cycle power. All right, that's it for this week. I would love to be with you again next week. Until then, keep living life according to your own brilliant rhythm. <laughs>